Hello! This is a new video about timelines and about nativization. I uh, thought it would be a good topic to explore, which is kind of like why you would want to nativize. Um, how do you nativize things? And timelines are something a lot of designers will use and that you will want to be able to nativize um, in a couple of different ways possibly. So first let's look at a timeline actor that I made. So if we look at this, very simple. On begin play, I play a timeline and I scale what comes out of the timeline uh, and set the relative location of this ball, right? So I do that in Blueprint. Uh, I have a C++ version of the same actor here, um, which you see has no nothing in the event graph. It has the same components, but they're inherited. And it has a timeline component that you don't see in the blueprint one like this. You see it down here in components here. So it exists as a component. You just don't see it in the same way. So we take a look here, and I play. You'll see they're both moving the same, right? So let's, let's quickly take a look at the performance of these. And then I'll show you how to nativize this blueprint one into C. So if you go to Window, Developer Tools, Session Front End, you will open the Session Front End. And if you go to Profiler, you will see um, a place here where you can profile. I'm going to move that off screen here. Um, in fact, if you notice, it's not set up to capture. So I'm going to have to do the embarrassing thing of stopping and rerunning. Sometimes the session front end will get confused if you do it more than once, and you might have to close the editor to get it to work again. Okay, so now if we go to the profiler, yeah, this little button here captures data. Okay, so I'm going to move that off screen here, and we're just going to start simulating, right? Now I'm going to start the profiler here. I'm going to stop it. Let's transfer the data to this machine. And let's load the file and stop the simulation. Okay, let's take a look at our session front end here. So this tells you what things cost. Let's look on the game thread. And if we go to frame time, we can click the little fire and see what's the most expensive. And, you know, I'm going to ignore the slate stuff. Um, let's go to frame time. Look in here. Okay. So if we look here, you can see the timeline component in the blueprint, it cost 0.053 milliseconds, which is 50% of the tick time. Okay, look, if you look down here, you can see the C++ version of it took 0.012 milliseconds, which is 11%, right? So it's about five times faster running out of C. So that's, let that sink in. <laughs> Anyway, okay, so that's the reason you would want to nativize this, is that it's five times faster. So how do we nativize it? Well, I've already done it, but I will make another one to show you. Here's my C++ version. So let's make a new C++ class. We'll call it an actor. Call it timeline actor 2, because I already have a 1, which is the one I made before. Let's create it. Close this. And it should update so that we can see our timeline actor 2 here shortly. There it is. So when you're making a new actor, make sure you delete this stuff. I want it as clean as possible to start with. Organization is the most important thing, more important than anything else. Okay, so the first thing we want to do, as always, is to set these both to false. And this is so the blueprint that we make based on it will have the tick box dechecked that says ticking. Um, that way it's easy to see it is not ticking. Okay, so what components are we going to need? Let's make a scene component. 
So this will be where it's located. Let's make a static mesh component. Right. And then we're going to need a timeline component. Right. And if you know, you want to keep the includes here to a minimum. So let's include our timeline component here. And the reason we do this is it's a forward declaration. And a forward declaration is always prevents having to recompile things. It makes things faster. Um, it won't when this class changes, it will only um, it won't make everything recompile. Um, anywho, so let's go back. So our we need to actually create our objects, right? So Creating our root scene component. Let's set it as the root component. Okay. Okay. Now we need to create our static mesh component. Okay. Um, let's see. We need to attach it. And if you noticed, it doesn't know how. It doesn't know this function, right? It's because it says the type is incomplete. That means you just need to include its header. So I know that it's in components, static mesh component. But if you didn't know that, you could go here, static mesh component. And in Rider, you can just hit F12, and it will go to the header file. And then you could look here, and you could see where it's located. That, or you can Google it. You can find it there, too. So here we go set up static mesh component. Now let's make our timeline component. Like that. All right. So we created our root, we've attached the static mesh to it, and we created a timeline. The timeline component, if you look at it, you'll find it is a uactor component. So it actually has no transform. So you don't need to attach it to anything because it doesn't move, right? Okay, so now that we've created these objects, um, we're going to need to start the timeline up on begin play. So let's override begin play, right? which I deleted before, I know. Um, now, call the super, and we want to tell our timeline to start doing stuff. So first thing, is you'll see it's a complete incomplete type as well, right? So let's include its header file. Okay, now we can say set, look at all these functions we've got. So the first thing is looping. Let's set that to true because that's what we had set in the blueprint, although I didn't show it. Um, we want to loop its movement, right? Um, and now we're gonna wanna add a curve to the timeline, right? If we, which I didn't show you, I need to go show you what I did, but um, basically I wanna use a curve asset in that timeline instead of um, having the curve within the timeline. If, if a designer made the curve within the timeline, you'll need to make a separate curve asset um, so that you can you know, move it to native code. So how do we do that? Well, we need to get a reference to it first, right? So let's make a U property. We'll make it edit defaults, so you can edit it in the archetype blueprint, which is the blueprint blueprint in the content browser only, right? And it's just a U curve float like that. And if you saw it, auto included it again, so let's kill that. There we go. Let's pop that there. notice I don't like I like these to be alphabetic and that is for organization purposes and you can do this too this will keep things organized especially as things get big they won't hear but they may so timeline component set looping so how do we add a curve to it well if you go timeline component we can add 
and chirp float. Look at that. So it says it's a float curve, and then there's a delegate there, and some property names if you want to use property names. So let's add and chirp float. So we got our curve float. And then we need an F on timeline float and chirp function. So let's do F on timeline float. And that will be our timeline tick. Right? So. Okay, and we don't need to worry about those property names at the moment. So this timeline tick delegate, well, what does that do? Well, we need to tell it what function to call when the timeline ticks while it's interpolating this float. So we need to bind to this timeline tick delegate. Right? Bind new function. All right, so we need to bind it to us and we need to bind it to a name of a function. So on timeline tick. Right? You can name that whatever you want, but this needs to be named the actual name of a function, right? So let's make that. that. But you might say, well, what about the arguments? How do we know what the arguments are for this delegate? And I will show you. So if you look at F on timeline float and you hit F12, you can follow it. And you can see here, it's got one parameter, which is a float output. So that needs to be the arguments of our function. So we do this. Like that. So let's pop that into our function here. I'm not going to change that so I can make it a const. And the other thing is this has to be a u function, right? If it's not, you see here where I say bind u function, that is going to fail. You're just going to get a crash in the editor if you don't. So we've added this. It's going to call this, right? We're going to want to set relative location, right? What do we put in there? our new relative location and then we're going to say this output times some arbitrary value. Okay. So while it's ticking, we're going to adjust the static mesh's location. That's exactly what they did in the blueprint. Um, and normally you'll have to have the blueprint open side by side while you're doing this so you know what's happening, but this is so simple. Um, Okay, now there's one other thing. We need to set the time length length mode, right? So that's how the timeline knows when to be done. The timeline length mode, last keyframe. So you can choose the timeline length, which you can specify, or you can just use the last keyframe in the float, which is what I'm gonna do. And then I'm gonna start it playing. All right, so it's gonna loop. Here's the delegate to call when it ticks. Um, here's the curve to use. Here's the timeline length mode so that it knows when to repeat. And here's what to do while it's ticking, all right? So this is all fine and good. One thing though, what if this curve float is invalid? Like what if they don't set it? So if not is valid, we're gonna Be great, right? And then we're going to return because it can't work without a curve, right? But we don't want it to crash if somebody forgot to put the curve in there. Anything that can cause a crash, you need to guard against because somebody's going to do it. Um, so here we go. Let's take a run. here our blueprints and here's that version that I had made earlier let's kill that here's a curve that I made 
So in the blueprint, which I didn't show you well enough, you see begins play, plays the curve, multiplies the Z location on the curve by 100, um, and moves the static mesh. Right? That's all it does. If you look in here, it's using this curve. Right? So we would make a new blueprint, and we would do Timeline Actor 2, which is the one we just made. I'm just going to name it CPP because um, that way it's easy to keep track of which is which. Let me look in here. So here's our curve float. Let's just leave it blank. We know it's going to error, but we'll do it anyway. And I can't see the sphere because it's in the engine content. So let's turn that on and go sphere. And find, yeah, basic shape sphere. There it is. Okay. That's good. And our curve is empty, which would cause a crash if we didn't guard against it. So let's pop this in here. Let's see. And run. Oh, look. Here's our error message. Invalid curve float. Wow, there's actually one in the engine content. Let's turn that back off so you don't see it. Okay. There we go. We've done it. So here was our blueprint. Right. Simulating. And here's our C version of it, which is five times faster. See? And and that was worth it, right? Five times faster. Um Thanks for watching the video. I'm going to continue and make more videos about how to nativize different things because I think it's very useful and it's not, there's not a whole lot of documentation on how to do it other than to get into the engine in a lot of cases. If you have any uh, requests, just let me know. Thanks.